Thanks, everyone. As uh, was just mentioned, yeah, we're going to talk about how it uh, helped enable our community and the RHI SAC. We're going to talk about how I helped enable a community at the RHI SAC with uh, using some open source tooling. Uh, so here's a look at the agenda in which we'll go over today. Uh, but first, uh, we'll do a little bit of background on what the RHI SAC is. Um, for those of you that are unaware, uh, we're the Retail and Hospitality Information Sharing and Analysis Center. And we like to place a, an emphasis on the sharing part of that. Uh, and what that means is we're a secure place for consumer-facing organizations to come together to share related cybersecurity information and intelligence and to not only protect their own companies, but to help strengthen the entire sector as a rising tide lifting all boats. Uh, currently, we're just over 250 member uh, organizations with over 3,100 member users in our community. And the chart on the right is just a little breakdown of the different types of uh, sectors that our members um, are in. We're not just retail and hospitality, we also have consumer packaged goods, um, restaurants, food retail, travel, loyalty companies. Uh, basically, if you're if you are consumer facing, uh, you'd be eligible uh, to join our ISAC. And besides just the sharing community, we also offer uh, multiple different uh, working groups uh, as listed here, whether it's like security focused uh, collaboration groups or tool specific based groups. Um, like, like our MISP working group uh, or our special interest groups. Um, some of these groups are, are run on different cadences. Some are biweekly, some meet by uh, monthly, and some meet quarterly. Uh, but enough about uh, what my organization is. Uh, now I would like to talk a little bit about MISP. So first, uh, we'll start with uh, our, our MISP uh, architecture overview for our infrastructure. Um, a little bit of background, uh, we wanted to build this out um, as like a, an enterprise application. Uh, you know, we were re replacing uh, a proprietary Threat Intel platform at the time, and so we really wanted to make sure that in the data in there was going to, to stay in there. If a member tried to log in and access MISP, they would be able to access MISP. And so we ended up going with a high availability serverless infrastructure uh, hosted in AWS. Uh, our, our images uh, are, are built up uh, in the Amazon ECS, and they reach into uh, the Amazon Elastic Container Registry to pull down our, our image, which is just a clone of the MISP Docker repo with just some slight tweaks and modifications uh, for, our infrastructure, for our environment. Uh, we have different images spun up across different availability zones, uh, at least two instances, one in each availability zone at any given time. Uh, as uh, load on the MISP increases, um, the servers will, or it'll spin up more um, and scale up to meet demand. And we have separated out the database into Amazon Aurora, uh, and that, that's the same thing. It also scales up and down uh, as, as load on that is needed. And all of that is behind our uh, AWS Elastic Load Balancer, and sitting in front of the load balancer is the AWS WAF. And we mainly just use some of the built-in AWS rule sets. We're not doing anything custom there. As far as our authentication, we have tied our authentication into our SSO platform in which we use, uh, which makes it really nice because we have some automation in the background. So we don't have to worry about user administration at all. Um, all of that's handled by our membership team. So as we have members get credentialed into our sharing platforms, uh, they are automatically have access to MISP and can access it through there. And uh, looking at the right-hand side over here, uh, we use AWS Lambda uh, to, to run some uh, automation, uh, one being uh, to log into our Microsoft uh, Outlook mailbox uh, to, uh, use, um, to make use of our mail to MISP. Um, we have some members that share Intel. They send an email to our, our in, uh, MISP inbox. And the Lambda will log into that, parse it out, and create MISP events, and then push that back through the, through the front door, through the WAF, into our instances, as well as the Lambda also runs um, our Pyote uh, enrichment and vetting. So as part of like all the intel that comes in, we're using Pyote, the Python Open Threat Intelligence Library uh, that I've developed and that we published under our RHISAC GitHub. Uh, and that'll check, you know, 
depending on the indicator type, it'll send to different Intel services, do lookups, find the reputations, and then pull all that back into MIS. And then a TLDR on our, our build, uh, our image build process, um, clones the repo and pulls in any needed submodules, uh, like, like our RHI SAC uh, taxonomy or Threat Actor Galaxy and our Fraud Galaxy. Um, it'll then get the needed AWS credentials, logs into the Elastic Container Registry, builds our Docker image, also tagging it appropriately, pushes that back to ECR, and then uh, we'll stop an existing MIS task, launches a new one, and then we're also ensuring the stability of our new images. Um, I should mention that we have a pre-production uh, environment and a production environment that are identical to this. Uh, so as we build out uh, new images with new updates, uh, we'll test it in pre-prod, and then once we're all good there, we push it over to production. I just wanted to talk a little bit about our community usage over the last year. Uh, at the RHI SAC Cyber Intel Summit last year, uh, the beginning of October 2023, was when we officially launched our community instance. Uh, so these are the numbers over the last year. Um, you can see we have 239 organizations that have had at least one person log into it at least one time. So uh, you know, out of 251, that's, that's a pretty high number. Uh, we've had 904 users log in to MISP at least one time. Uh, we have around 91 API users currently. And then the bottom is just a breakdown of uh, the, the different MISP events. Uh, and I've, I've split it out into core member um, and the RHI SAC Intel team. Uh, and the only really differentiator between that is uh, like the platform in which our members are sharing the Intel on. We have several different platforms uh, that members have access to, one being our Slack workspace. We have uh, what we call the member exchange, and that's just kind of like a forum board. You know, you can, you can post a thread, reply. Um, we have we have lots of different areas. We try not to restrict what, and tell members like, hey, this is the one way you need to do things um, and stick to it. Um, so we try to be more flexible. And uh, as you can see over the year, it's almost a, you know a, a fair split down the middle uh, in terms of getting members to to buy in and start contributing directly to MIS. Uh, and that could be whether you know either they're logging into the platform and and creating an event manually and sharing it there, or they've set up some sort of automation. Uh, to push events directly to MIS. I mentioned some of the different platforms in which we have. So on this left-hand side here, uh, this is going to be all the sources of where uh, Intel and our community can originate from. Uh, regardless of where this is being shared, it then gets pulled into our community MISP instance in the middle. And then our enrichment and vetting process is run on all the Intel within there. Uh, pushed back into MIS and then made available for dissemination uh, through these different avenues on the right-hand side, uh, whether that's logging directly into MIS, uh, someone wants to search for an indicator, hey, has this been seen? Um, they have some, some sort of automation set up uh, via the API uh, through scripts or integrations. Uh, and then we also have some members that run their own MISP instance and uh, get the intel uh, through the MISP synchronization. Uh, over the last year, our Intel team, uh, we've decided to develop our own uh, classification taxonomy. Um, so this kind of breaks down uh, three different things. The, the, the Intel source, which platform was the Intel shared on, uh, the member industry, who shared the Intel, what industry were they in, uh, and then finally the threat type. And this is just kind of like a generic uh, threat type classification. Um, this is not the all, ex all exhaustive list for threat types on the right-hand side. Um, I just wanted to get a screenshot that would fit, uh, and you wouldn't have to squint to see it. Um, so by having these three different um, uh, predicates in the taxonomy, now we're able to kind of do more granular breakdowns um, and reporting around the intel uh, that is being shared. So looking over the last year uh, at where the intel was shared, uh, we can see that the largest chunk has been to MISP directly, which is great. Uh, that means that we're getting members that are you know, buying into wanting to use the platform, uh, whether you know, they're, they're automating it, whether they're you know, logging in and, and sharing it. Uh, and then uh, second behind that is going to be the mail to MISP. Um, that's a great way. Before we had, uh, when we started really using the mail to MISP, we had uh, you know, just a traditional email list serve in which members, you know, every member could, could send an email, it would get sent to all the 3,100 plus analysts, 
Um, and then internally we were talking and you know, maybe that wasn't the most secure way to be sharing Intel and just having uh, unencrypted Intel uh, sitting in you know, 3,000 plus inboxes. Uh, so we, we since decommissioned the listserv and now we just have a single inbox where if members, uh, you know, if that's their preferred way to share, uh, great. We'll encourage that. We'll keep, we'll keep pulling that in. Uh, and then, uh, and third, third behind that is, is Slack. And, uh, we have a dedicated channel, um, called IOC specifically for sharing, uh, indicators, uh, Intel. Uh, and so again, we want to, allow members to share however, whatever works best for them. Uh, we don't want to add any complications to their process. Uh, we want to encourage sharing, not you know, in disencourage it. Looking at the member industries that shared Intel over the year, it's overwhelmingly been the retail members. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing really to gain for, uh, you know, insight wise from this, um, except that you know we, we hope to you know continue to to push MISP, um, you know get members to see the value in it, and then hopefully you know as they continue to share more, uh, you know we'll get a more diverse set of of intel being shared to our community. And then finally, uh, our threat type breakdown. So over the last year, I mean, an overwhelming amount of the intel, you know, nearly fifty percent of it has been credential harvester intel. Uh, and you know, almost a quarter, maybe a little bit more than a quarter, of that has been your, the call center phishing or like the callback malware. Uh, that's been a, an extremely hot trend right now. Uh, Google, Google, Google Groups phishing, uh, Geek Squad, you know, all that stuff. And then um, this this last chunk here is going to be malware delivery. Um, so this is what you know, initial access intel being shared, but maybe it wasn't specifically attributed to a certain malware family. <clears throat> And so we just kind of label it as malware delivery. And then as we get more granular, uh, as members get more granular in what they're sharing, you know, then we kind of tag it appropriately. Uh, you know, is it an info stealer? Uh, is it a loader? Uh, is it, a, you know, et cetera. So we have created our own um, galaxies within MISP. Um, currently, we have our Threat Actor Galaxy. Um, Many of you are probably familiar with the Threat Actor Galaxies out there. There's a few of them already in MISP. Uh, but we decided to, to catalog some of the most prolific or prominent threat actors that are known to target our members' industries, uh, specifically, you know, whether that's, you know, they go after retail or hospitality or travel. Uh, but we wanted to focus our efforts there um, as a starting point and then make that available as a resource for members to use. So whether they want to, hey, what intel do you have on Scattered Spider? Well, they can log in and they can look at our Scattered Spider threat actor profile, but then we can also then use that to tag all of our intel as well and kind of create that historical uh, archive of all the shared intel attributed to this group. Uh, but something I'm more uh, excited about is our fraud galaxy uh, that we're working on. Uh, and this is going to be a knowledge base of the numerous different fraud types that are affecting the RHISAC members uh, and then can also then be used to help enable them, regardless of their team size or budget, uh, to help combat fraud. And what that is going to look like uh, is this. So we've tried to identify by working with some of our retail, hospitality, travel, gaming members, uh, what are the fraud types that their teams are dealing with, uh, and basically just listing them all out. Um, you know, there's there's like the overall, you know, overarching, say, like receipt fraud, uh, you know, receipt fraud. But within that, there's multiple different sub-fraud types uh, of receipt fraud. And so uh, it took a little bit of inspiration from the Attack for Fraud uh, galaxy uh, that's already in MISP. Uh, and then wanted to make this out into like a matrix view so that we could have and highlight you know, all the different fraud types, uh, sub-fraud types included, that we'll then be able to then use when members share intel on this. You know, we can take it appropriately. Uh, but then also be able to, you know, for those members that maybe are looking to build out a fraud capability, you know, give them a, a place that they can come and they can, you know, learn from uh, and identify, you know, like in this example, what, what is digital skimming? I'm not too sure. And, you know, they can, they can read the description and say, oh, okay, uh, that makes sense. And then uh, by utilizing some of the elements in the galaxy, you know, we can highlight certain things like, you know, hey, here's the certain or specific member industries that this fraud type is going to affect. You know, digital skimming, if you have, you know, any, any sort of uh, online presence um, where you're taking payments, you're probably susceptible to this, uh, as well as being able to list out potential mitigations for the fraud types. So, you know, scanning for your vulnerabilities regularly, uh, taking inventory of your assets and so on. 
Uh, and then as we work more with our members, uh, collaborate with them, we're hoping to you know, identify detections and whether that's, you know, go here, do this, or if it's, you know, just actual, like, detections, like KQL queries, for example. Um, the possibilities are pretty limitless because uh, the elements are fully customizable as they're just key value pairs. Uh, we'll move on to our Intel sharing and normalization. Um, so when we were sharing on the listserv, uh, our members were sharing on the listserv. We had uh, a, a sharing template. It was basically just HTML table that would paste into the email. Uh, this is what it looks like, and uh, I've also then converted our sharing templates in, that we have uh, to the MISP template. So, you know, if they wanted to log directly into MISP, uh, you know, share, you know, create an event and then populate from a template, uh, they could then choose from our templates. It makes it real easy for them to just paste in, you know, highlights the different indicator types. You know, for example, you know, credential harvester, you know, phishing email, you know, phishing sender, subject, IP source, embedded link, etc. And we also use this for the mail to MISP. So, you know, a member will share some intel uh, with this template. They'll send it to our MISP inbox. And as part of the AWS Lambda uh, automation that we have, uh, it'll log in, read the email, parse out this, uh, this template, and then it'll populate a MISP event. Uh, and it'll keep it contextualized too, uh, which is great. And then Moving into mail to miss, um, we're currently using a, a fork of mail to miss. Um, it's been a while when we kind of forked it out. Um, as I mentioned, we have it, and we added the the part to be able to log into the uh, uh, Microsoft Exchange uh, O365. Um, so I don't have to like grab an email and then feed it to the library. It'll just like set up and run and go and grab it. It helps connect our infrastructure to, into MISP and replaces our old list serve. We also uh, rely a lot on MISP objects. Um, you know, the, I'll keep repeating this, but, but the, the context is king. Uh, it, the more context we can provide to the analysts when they're looking at Intel, uh, the, you know, the better that they're going to be suited. You know, they can look at something and say, oh, okay, here, here for example, if you, you know, we use comments and tagging, and so if, you know, they look at an IP address and you know, email sender IP, like they know undoubtedly that's what that was. And instead of just being a list of, say, you know, here's a bunch of senders, here's a bunch of IPs, here's a bunch of URLs, like you lose a lot of context that way. So by, by using the MISP objects, uh, and these, these are three that we've, uh, we've created and, and added to the MISP objects repo. Uh, but by using these, now we can keep that context together uh, and then make the intel more valuable in the end. We've also gone ahead and created our own documentation uh, for using MISP and how we'd like uh, you know, to advise our members to use MISP. So whether that's creating our PDF documents, um, you know, someone just wants to pull something up quick and read it. Uh, we've also gone ahead and made uh, video doc documentation or tutorials to follow some of these things as well uh, that kind of step-by-step -step walk members through how to do some of these different things. Moving on to enriching and vetting the attributes, uh, we use Pyote, as I mentioned. Uh, that's the Python Open Threat Intelligence Library. Uh, and it's an API framework that's built very modularly um, to kind of standardize all the disparate uh, Intel APIs out there. Uh, you know, every API is different, the way you call them, what headers you need to send. And, and so uh, when I joined the RHI SAC, uh, this, this process, this was pre, pre missed this process was like a process that took hours a day. Um, I'd spend half my day doing this. You know, we'd have to go through hundreds of indicators that are being shared, you know, add them into a spreadsheet, and then take the spreadsheet and upload them to different... It, it was just... It was... I did not like it. Uh, and it had to be a better way to do it. And so I started writing out some scripts. And as I was doing that, I'm like, hey, you know, maybe this will be more valuable uh, to others than just myself. Uh, so I decided to write it into a Python library. Uh, and the links at the bottom, uh, the top one is where you can find it. Uh, and I've also created a MISP taxonomy uh, to go along with Pyote um, that we use as part of our enrichment uh, tagging uh, to the attributes themselves. These aren't all the services that are included in Pyote, uh, but these are the ones that we use for our enrichment and vetting. Um, so based on the, the different attribute types, uh, determines on which services they're run through, uh, you know, emails we're checking, SPF DMARC records, is, is this domain spoofable, uh, you know, is it a disposable email address, using email rep.io to get, you know, reputation on the emails, 
uh, domains, getting domain risk scores, seeing if they're on reputation blacklists, uh, IPs, looking at the abuse confidence scores of them, um, also to see if they're on reputation blacklists. Uh, Gray Noise Riot is, is a great uh, service. Um, should, should note the ones that have asterisks here are, are kind of um, dual purpose. Um, they're for also identifying potential false positives. Uh, Gray Noise Riot, um, for those of you that don't know, um, provides, um, it, it looks up an IP and it'll give it uh, two different trust levels. There's two different trust levels that it can assign. So there'll be trust level one, which means it's a, a cloud IP space that's owned and controlled by the cloud provider. So, you know, like we don't want to pull in something and, and have it become vetted and it's really a Gmail IP and, you know, a member blocks that IP and it takes out, the, you know, their entire email uh, for, for a few days. Um, and then it also provides trust level two, which means, you know, hey, this is a cloud, um, you know, cloud IP, but it, it's not necessarily owned or controlled by the cloud provider. It's kind of rented out to them. Um, Google Safe Browsing is great. Um, you know, if Google's already identified something as a threat, um, then you know, let, let's make sure we get that added. Uh, and then also Circle Hash Lookup, uh, invaluable tool uh, in identifying potential false positives. Uh, sometimes we get members that share Intel, and you know, maybe they're sharing like the chain of events throughout you know several processes, and where like CMD spawned you know some VBS or whatever. Uh, we don't want to include that CMD hash uh, in our vetted indicators and have a member block that. Again, that would be you know potential impact uh, impact to their business. Uh, and then VirusTotal as well. They have their uh, known software distributor. Um, and so we kind of use that in conjunction with the circle hash lookup uh, to identify those potential false positives. Uh, but VirusTotal, we're also using that um, for hashes. If it's got a popular threat classification label, uh, we're then taking that and then applying that as a tag to the intel itself. Uh, and so what this kind of looks like, uh, Cobalt Strike Beacon config uploaded to VT, config extracted. We've got one member that they, they pull down all these different Cobalt Strike samples uh, and then they're extracting the configs from Cobalt Strike uh, and then they're uh, sending them over uh, to us. Um, and so we, we use that uh, CS Beacon config MISP object uh, to then group these all together to, to keep that context there. Uh, and, you know, they'll share, you know, it depends on how many, but there could be, you know, anywhere from five to ten different MISP objects in one share. Um, and so rather than sharing five to ten different events, we use the object, they can group them all together and just share that one time. And here you can kind of see some of these file hashes. These are the, the popular threat classification labels uh, from VirusTotal, you know, Trojan Beacon, Cobalt Strike, uh, Java, etc. And, and here's some IPs associated with malicious SMTP authentication attempts. Um, once we've run our enrichment process in the vetting, uh, we, we apply the tag to uh, this enrich tag, so then that lets members know, hey, okay, this has already been enriched. Uh, we can pull this down. Uh, we take advantage of highlighting uh, our taxonomy as well as the TLP taxonomy, uh, because then right there at the top, you know, it gets that breakdown. You can see the different, you know, the source of where it was shared, the, the industry of the member who shared it, the threat type, uh, et cetera. And then diving into this, we can see you know, as part of that Pyote enrichment process, uh, you know, this first IP, Spam House, it's on their reputation block list, as well as Barracuda Central. You know, this second IP has got a low abuse confidence score. It wasn't seen in any, any, any reputation block lists. Uh, but this third one is a high abuse confidence score. It's on two reputation block lists. And so, again, this extra context is, helps our analysts, you know, make, make better, well-informed decisions, you know, kind of on the fly as they're doing their investigations. Uh, and then based on like, our own criteria that we have in place uh, determines if, if an indicator or attribute will become vetted uh, and, and that just means that you know we're, we're finding the known bad stuff, uh, making sure there's no false positives in there uh, and then applying that tag and then members will then consume you know the vetted in indicators uh, as a feed. Um, it's not a feed in the, the misfeed sense but you know they'll, they'll do a search uh, vetted RHI sec or RHI sec vetted indicators for the last 24 hours. Anything they pull, you know, based on the indicator type. Maybe they're sending file hashes to their endpoint tools to do alerting or blocking on. Maybe they're sending other stuff to their SIM tools. Or uh, there's there's a lot of possibilities uh, and a lot of ways in which they have that set up. And that kind of segue, segues really good into this next slide uh, to the Intel interoperability and the integrations. 
Uh, our team has currently helped uh, integrations with over 17 named different platforms. Uh, these are all listed on the bottom here. Uh, we have several custom or one-off integration scripts uh, and, and quite a few more that we're currently working on. Uh, and so uh, integrating as a member, what that process looks like. Uh, there's some that are one-click apps, um, maybe like the, the MIS 4.2 Splunk, uh, where it's a Splunk TA app. You can just go in there, you can install the app, generate the key, uh, configure it with the key and you know the tag that you're looking for and where the server is, and then tweak it as needed. Uh, and we also help integrate with custom scripts. Uh, and, that, and that process is, is pretty much the same thing. Um, you know, just installing the app, generating the key, configuring it, and then making sure it runs on a cadence somewhere, you know, cron job somewhere, or scheduled task. We also have uh, a, a couple different uh, integrations that we've developed and maintained for our members, um, mainly for Splunk, Microsoft Graph API, that can be used then in Azure Sentinel or Defender for Endpoint. Uh, CrowdStrike, and then uh, just some generic scripts. So, you know, we've got something that'll pull MISP for the last 24 hours, grab all the vetted in indicators, uh, you know, in different languages like Python, PowerShell, Curl, um, and our repo for those integrations can be found at the bottom. Sometimes we also have members that use an MDR or an MSSP. Uh, they want to integrate their tool with them, uh, or, you know, their, their tool with our Intel. Uh, but since you know, that tool is being managed by a third party, we kind of have a separate process laid out, uh, which involves like having an initial discussion with our team, our Intel team, the member team, and, and that third party team. Uh, the vendor is the one that configures the integration on their end, and we just ask our member team to provide them the credentials, uh, something that you know uh, is credentialed under their domain, um, and then tweak it as needed and, and set up and get going. And we also have um, MISP synchronization set up. So you know we we operate our community MISP instance, and we have members that run their own, and they just set up the synchronization, and you know they're pulling that Intel down as we're publishing it, uh, and then and when they want to share Intel back to us, it's literally just a click of a button. Um, you know that's that's part of their workflow. They're already working in MISP, um, and so it's great because they're not having to copy paste, go to Slack, send an email, you know log into another tool. It just it just helps kind of streamline that and make that Intel more timely as they're sharing it. And what's next for uh, the RHISAC community? Uh, next we want to start looking at the MISP workflows. Um, and we operate by TLP Amber Strict, uh, by under TLP Amber Strict by default. So if a member doesn't tag something or share something with you know attributed TLP, we default to Amber Strict. Uh, and so that's like the first place I would like to go to where, you know, using a MISP workflow to where on publish, if no TLP tag, automatically apply the TLP Amber Strict tag. Um, I know there's a ton more things we could do there, but um, we, we haven't leveraged the workflows at all. Um, and so that's kind of where I'd like to start. Uh, and then the warning lists too. Um, I have a couple of them enabled currently, um, but I think that's a more valuable resource that, that we're not leveraging enough, um, and that's also there to help identify more potential false positives, uh, whether using existing ones or being able to create our own. Uh, we've had a few times where, you know, as part of that enrichment and vetting process um, that's that's automated, had a member reach out and say, "Hey, I think uh, I think this one might not be, you know." In, uh, you know, 100% malicious. I think it's more just an, an indication of activity. Um, you know, s certain stuff like to CDN sites. Um, but that's the main example that jumps to my head. So, uh, looking to leverage the warning list more uh, because then, as a member, uh, you know, they can, as part of their integration, you know, we'll still do the vetting the same. But then they can say, you know, give me the last 24 hours of the vetted indicators, but I want you to enforce warning lists, and then this will prevent them from pulling any indicators down that uh, have been flagged as being on any of these warning lists. Uh, and then lastly, we'd like to do more contributions uh, to the MISP community. Uh, and I think our, our first place we're going to look to do that uh, is going to be through the, the MISP uh, fraud galaxy that we're working on. Um, there's, there's nothing proprietary in there. Uh, and I think it would just be good for, for the whole sector uh, rather than you know, kind of keeping it within us. Um, and so that's kind of what we're looking for next steps. And uh, before I take any questions, I just want to say a huge thank you to Circle, uh, one, for hosting this, uh, having me come, uh, and two, for all, all the fa fantastic work uh, that you guys do, uh, in including working on MISP. Uh, and with that, I'll pause and open up to any questions.
Christians, so I'm going to be the annoying guy, considering you're sharing uh, IP addresses, uh, what is your GDPR policy? Um, I'm from America, and so we don't... <laughs> but the, we don't but the IP GDPR addresses there. might be European, it still affects you. True, um, but I, in all seriousness, I guess that's not something that we've really considered too deeply, uh, as we don't have to follow uh, GDPR as, as we operate out of the United States. Um, however, that's not to say that we don't have we have plenty of international members um, from Europe uh, as well, um, and so I'm not, I'm not I'm not honestly I'm not sure where to go because that's not something I've had to really think about. I can answer these questions. On the MIS project page, you have a directory slash compliance for GDPR, and we have plenty of documents about GDPR and compliance of information sharing. And technically, GDPR is an enabler for information sharing. Um, so, for example, you have a recital, which is actually covering the fact of sharing information to protect infrastructures. And so the GDPR is an enabler. It's not... A, because a lot of people think that the GDPR is blocking sharing, it's completely the opposite, because it's actually legalize the fact to share information to protect infrastructures. Anyone else? Any questions? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, this data set is coming from about 15 members um, that, that contribute uh, directly to MISP. Um, two of them have set up you know, automation around this. Uh, we just, the RHI site just finished, had their, uh, our last uh, Cyber Intel Summit uh, two weeks ago in Dallas, and we did a you know, this similar presentation there. Uh, and again, like the interest kind of went up from there. Uh, we do like a yearly uh, sharing challenge. Um, so we group organizations together based on like revenue and then team sizes and to kind of help gamify like sharing in, within the community and then we acknowledge that with awards. And so um, after that, you know, it was the day after the, our, our awards dinner. And so a lot of, it was like on members' minds, like, how can I, you know, my, how can I get onto the leaderboard? You know, I, I want to share more. And so it's like, you know, we can help automate number one, like, you know, that's probably going to be the best way. Um, and so we've got about, like I said, 15, 15 members that are actively contributing. Uh, the rest of this is uh, intel that they're sharing, just you know, not into MISP. It might be on Slack or the member exchange or an, or an email. Um, and so we just wanted to kind of show that breakdown. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you.